I'm Chris Voss. That's a picture of me if you can't see me from the back. Um, I'm a senior software development engineer at Microsoft. Um, I joined both Microsoft and Xbox Cloud Gaming in 2018, August or so. Um, uh, originally, I was uh, on the team that is managing our Xbox servers, um, keeping them healthy, making sure they're up to date, all that fun stuff. Um, more recently, last couple of years, I've been on our infrastructure team, um, game, game streaming shared services. Our team manages and operates the infrastructure for Xbox Cloud Gaming services. So, you know, Azure resources such as Cosmos DB or storage accounts or key vaults, all that fun stuff, our Kubernetes uh, clusters, obviously. Um, and then we also have some services that are kind of shared across all of our other teams um, that uh, we also own. Uh, if you'd like to contact me, um, these certainly work. I'm sure there are others that I forgot, but um, you know, if you want to reach out to me, these are definitely good places. Um, so a little bit about Xbox Cloud Gaming. So um, it comes for free if you have Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, um, and basically it enables you to play games wherever you want on whatever device you want. Um, and our motto is, um, or our mission, rather, is uh, allowing people to play the games you want with the people you want on the devices you already own. Um, you know, it's important uh, to us, um, you know, to enable anyone who would like to play games to play those games. It's, um, you know, it's a way of connecting people who might be, you know, from great distances and giving them shared experiences. And um, so, yeah, that, that's a big motivation behind our team and our product. Um, so a little bit about what our footprint looks like. Um, we have 26, um, roughly, AKS clusters, um, and AKS is Azure Kubernetes Services. I forgot to add that um, in there, but um, uh, across several Azure regions. Um, we have 50 or so microservices. I think it's a little bit more than that now, but 50 plus is good. Um, and about 700 to 1,000 pods per cluster. So, um, yeah. Uh, spread, spread across those 26-ish clusters, um, we have about 22,000 pods around the world. Um, and, and just a little bit about the servers. You know, so when you're playing a game, um, uh, you're streaming a game, um, what you're streaming from is actually a Xbox Series X hardware, um, it's a custom designed modification of the Xbox Series X hardware. And it's deployed in data centers around the globe. So um, when you're playing, you're really playing on an Xbox and then we're giving you all the signals um, and, uh, allow, and then allowing your feedback to come back and connect to that console. So a little bit about our tech stack. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we're, we're part of Microsoft, so we're gonna be using Microsoft products, but um, we are also huge adopters of as much open source as we can. Um, these are some CNCF projects um, along with uh, some of the other stuff we use. So, uh, you know, all of our services are um, written in, dot, well, the majority of our services are written in .NET. Um, uh, we run inside Azure Kubernetes service. Um, we use Docker to containerize all of our services, and um, we use Helm to deploy them, and we use Linkerd along with Flagger in order to um, use Canary deployments, and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, and FluentBit is what we use for our logging pipeline, and Prometheus, uh, as you might imagine, is metrics. Um, so, you know, to kind of level set, make sure, you know, I'm not sure how many folks are already completely familiar with service meshes, um, but, you know, just make sure we all are kind of on the same page, you know, what is a service mesh? Um, and of course, you know, there are several different service meshes out there, all with, you know, unique functionality, um, but there are some things that kind of unite them as well. And so, um, really the way I, I think about it is, you know, it provides controls around the traffic inside of your clusters. Sometimes out of, um, but you know, for the most part, it's inside that cluster. Um, and there is a spec uh, for the service mesh interface, and it has um, specs around uh, traffic access control metrics, specs, and specs are really like the CRDs for um, uh, routing rules and, and such, and split, um, which is what we use in order to uh, do our canary releases. Um, and so if you want to check out the, the actual full spec, you can go to that link. All right, so you know, now we understand at least somewhat what a service mesh is. Uh, you know, why 
do you want one? Why did we want one? Why might you? Um, for us, a huge, huge, huge motivator was to simplify our service-to-service -service TLS, or mutual TLS, MTLS for short, story. Previously, we managed our own solution. We had to uh, you know, get our certificates created, get them deployed into the right clusters, into the right namespaces, all that fun stuff, um, load them into our service, and then we got the fun uh, option of troubleshooting it when there were problems. And that caused a lot of pain in the beginning. And um, so service meshes became on our road, or you know, on our horizon pretty quickly because uh, it created a lot of friction of like spinning up a new service or things like that. Um, we also really, really, really wanted code flighting and progressive deployments. We wanted to be able to, you know, build confidence in a deployment before we just shove it on out there on everyone. Um, we've had several times where that saved us from like major outages because um, our uh, auto rollback uh, worked. Um, observability. So, you know, just like in the, the service mesh interface spec, there was metrics. Um, you know, being able to understand what's going on inside your system, inside your cluster, inside your um, service mesh, incredibly important as you probably know. And um, most service meshes provide that for you. Um, and code-free instrumentation, that was huge. Um, we did not want to you know, have to pull in tons of different libraries into our .NET and hope they're in .NET and then um, you know, bloat up essentially our containers with code that we weren't necessarily maintaining. So, you know, our service mesh search began around 2020. Um, so basically what happened was a few of my colleagues went to KubeCon, CloudNativeCon 2019 in San Diego. Um, and uh, specifically, my, my former manager, um, saw a Linkerd um, booth and there was like a challenge to set up MTLS in a cluster in five minutes. And he was able to do it. And so immediately that put Linkerd on our list of like, hey, those are service meshes you should check out. Obviously, you know, it's cool that like one was easy to use, but you wanna make sure you're still choosing the right one. And so, um, you know, we, we, we evaluated several which are listed here. Um, we, we did want to make sure, you know, every service mesh met our requirements. And so we wanted to make sure it uh, implemented the service mesh interface because uh, we wanted to use canary deployments. We also wanted to make sure we had efficient resource utilization, especially CPU, because most of our services are pretty much CPU bound. And so, um, you know, any service mesh that we're adding on top of that is just going to add more CPU pressure if it's high utilization. Um, observability, you know, I, I already talked about that in the previous one, um, but we, need, we wanted to make sure we could, you know, make sense of what was going on inside the, the service mesh. And set up slash maintenance ease. Um, and, you know, this is really, we don't want to have a team that's dedicated to our service mesh. We want to have a team that's dedicated to all of our infrastructure. So if the maintenance or, or setup are incredibly difficult and painful, we'll likely have to dedicate, you know, one, two, people to it um, just to maintain it over time. And that was just not scalable for us. So we, we sat down and we said, okay, you know, we, we kind of looked at all the features and said, okay, these are the few that um, we really want to investigate. And so like someone on our team put together prototypes and we evaluated all of them. Um, and as you might imagine, Linkerd won. Um, winning is maybe not the right term. It's more fit our needs exactly. Um, so, you know, basically efficient resource utilization, it was very good there. Traffic splitting, you know, using the service mesh interface, um, uh, we're able to get that functionality. Observability comes with a ton of metrics out of the box. Um, and low latency. Um, you know, obviously, whenever you're adding something into your call stack, if it is, you know, adding a significant amount of latency and you have multiple layers of calls, uh, that can get pretty nasty pretty quick. And so um, that was a big deal for us as well. So, you know, some of the ways that we're using Linkerd um, to scale our business. So now that we've chosen Linkerd, um, you know, we're, we're using MTLS, obviously, with cert rotation, um, which, you know, it's in the title of the, the talk, so that's probably not super surprising. Um, we're also using it in high availability mode. This is something that we 
missed kind of when we were initially doing our deployments is um, we saw that like if a bunch of services were getting deployed at the same time, they were having um, uh, container, or, uh, yeah, pod injection, uh, sorry, <laughs> container injection into the pod um, uh, was having issues essentially. And that's because there was only one instance of Linkerd running and we were not running in high availability mode. Pretty easy thing to fix, just was something we didn't recognize right away. Um, very important if you're going to production with Linkerd. Prometheus metrics. So to be completely honest, we did not use Prometheus metrics before we started using Linkerd. Um, we had a way of getting some of the internal metrics out into our own um, systems and you know we used that, but it was costly and again, it required a lot of maintenance from us. Um, Obviously, we use the Service Mesh Interface extension um, for Canary releases because it's very important to us to have that, and um, Linkerd does support that. Um, also, and, and this you know, is probably something that can be said about you know, most open source communities, but you know, this is one of my first experiences with it, and um, we've had a really good experience working with the Linkerd community. Um, this link here is a colleague of mine, Abraham. Um, he was the one who kind of went through and, and did some of the prototyping work and um, opened several issues on the Linkerd um, uh, GitHub and you know, worked with them to drive those to conclusion in order to enable us to uh, move forward. So uh, I'll go into a little, all of those in a little bit more detail. Um, so MTLS, zero config MTLS is simple. Um, and, and honestly, I considered having that be the only bullet point on this slide because that is how much most of us have to think about it now that it's all set up. It's essentially um, like, so for instance, when uh, we have been moving to a new architecture for our clusters and um, I was tasked with kind of getting all of our uh, uh, plugins to Kubernetes working and Linkerd is one of them. And I was incredibly nervous. I, I'm not a security expert. I'm not a certificate expert or anything like that and when I, put down what I thought was the right things and um, you know, executed our Terraform code. Um, I, I was confident that I had messed it up because it just worked. And to be completely honest, I had to ask other people to like, help me figure out whether or not it was working because I really, really didn't believe it. But it, it, it honestly was. That, I mean, that is not a lie. I, like that's, you know, sometimes people say things like that, but it, it genuinely was, I had to go and ask uh, someone else to just, help me check my work because it seemed too easy. Um, you know, and you know, like I said previously, we've secured over 50 microservices and 22,000 pods around the globe. So observability, this was huge for us, code-free visibility. So we don't, didn't need to have um, uh, a bunch of instrumented code in order to get these metrics out. Um, we also, uh, interestingly, um, essentially use some of the metrics to uh, drive our canary deployments. So uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more later, so maybe I won't jump the gun there. But um, you know, so some of the things that we, we use it for, HTTP response codes, latency monitoring, obviously canary deployment status, request volume, and it comes with its own Prometheus, which for us, again, you know, we weren't using Prometheus before. Um, and so the fact that it came with its own Prometheus instance um, really, kind of allowed us to see the power of what we were missing, and so um, it also pushed us to kind of adopt that. Um, so let's dig in on Canary deployments a little bit. Um, so for folks who are not familiar with Canary deployments, they're similar you know, in idea to like green, uh, green blue deployments, but slightly different. Green blue is where you like stand up, you know, essentially a duplicate of your um, service, and then you tear down your previous one. And, it's essentially a seamless cutover. Um, for canary deployments though, um, we have this little visualization, oh, you can't see my mouse, but um, we have this little visualization, ah, here we go, laser pointer. All right, so we have this little uh, visualization here. So, you know, in stage one, when I'm you know, deploying a service, uh, you know, th these controllers represent people who are wanting to play a game, right? And so you know, initially, we're trying to be cautious, and so maybe we'll give one out of six gamers a, uh, you know, access to our new, new deployment. And if we find that that's working well, we eventually move it on to um, our second stage of you know, 
two control two players out of six, and you know, further on, uh, the more confidence we build, uh, the further along it will deploy, and we'll either detect you know some sort of issue with you know perhaps it's a scale issue, you know maybe it gets seventy five percent of the way. 75% of the traffic, and then all of a sudden there's a scale problem and we roll it back. Um, we have integrated our uh, Canary deployments um, into our Azure DevOps release pipelines um, to enable auto rollback. So if we, if we detect that there's a problem, um, we will automatically roll, black, roll back. So um, you know, in that instance, it would go all blue controllers. Um, or in the uh, case of success, which is you know, hopefully the more likely uh, scenario, uh, you're going to have all green controllers, so everything is executing new code. Um, and it's a flexible canary evaluation. Um, so some of our key learnings from Flagger, things we didn't think about when we first set out trying to use it. Um, the biggest thing was how to handle canary deployments for different types of workloads. Um, you know, and some of those are like non-HTTP calls. Uh, you know, such as like UDP or things like that, um, or asynchronous uh, call patterns, you know, like you're using a message queue or things like that, um, or cron job type workloads. Um, we have several services that have like periodic um, background services that kind of spin up, do some work inside the service, maybe, you know, fill a cache or something like that, and then go away. You know, detecting whether or not those things are you know, good in a canary scenario is not just looking at HTTP response codes or, you know, latency, but instead emitting some sort of signal that gives your, uh, you know, canary evaluator a um, idea of what's going on. Uh, and also, not all services have constant or high volumes. So, like, sure, even if your service is entirely bound to, you know, re receive HTTP calls, if you're in a dip in your, you know, daily cycle or whatever, um, you may have some issues with uh, false positives or maybe underreporting, things like that, where you're not able to make a um, uh, super uh, great uh, evaluation. Um, and this is something that really was sneaky for us. Um, traffic to our liveness and readiness endpoints w were skewing our canary evaluation. Um, so in the instance on those like, you know, dips and things like that, if we were deploying and we saw, uh, you know, oh, it looks like there's a fairly steady call pattern across that time, looks good to us, but really all it was was our health endpoints, which absolutely are important and hopefully are, you know, indicating some level of health, but, you know, some of the point of the Canary uh, deployments is to detect the things that you aren't already checking for. And so that's just another thing to you know, keep in the back of your mind uh, if, should you go forward doing something like this. All right, so engineering and cost savings. This is huge and not something that we necessarily expected. We hoped for, but didn't necessarily expect. Um, so engineers were freed from supporting in-house MTLS. Not only is this like a time savings and engineering work, but it's also a happiness uh, improvement because not everybody wants to have to think about, you know, how do I get my cert into my service and into my cluster and how do I get it generated and who do I have to go to, you know, to uh, rotate it or, or things like that. Um, and so, you know, happiness, time, awesome. Uh, and we also had reduced spend on alternative, alternative observability solutions. Um, and, and, you know, I had mentioned, I think, briefly previously that we were kind of sending some of our Kubernetes metrics out into our own system and, and handling it there. Um, and kind of coalescing on Prometheus for all of our Kubernetes metrics um, have really helped us uh, reduce spend there. Uh, and these two things alone uh, have resulted in thousands of dollars of savings per month. All right, so a little bit about where we're going to be going with Linkerd. These are things we haven't fully fleshed out. They're ideas we've got. They're you know scenarios on our backlog, um, but uh, service to service auth. So you know, sure, we've got MTLS, we've got secure communication. But you know, if a bad actor gets access to one of our pods and they start you know making calls to other pods to try to find you know vulnerabilities or things like that, um, we want to try to reduce the risk of that. Um, and uh, Linkerd does support that. Um, also, multi-cluster communication and failover. So um, previously, in our previous architecture, um, we weren't really, we had no need for multi-cluster communication. All of our 
clusters were essentially, you know, the same and they, you know, had their perfect scope and they didn't really care what was going on in the others, um, which was convenient for some situations, but not great for other situations, especially reliability. Um, and so um, now that we've got kind of a better architecture for it, um, we're absolutely going to be working on multi-cluster communication and, ab and definitely failover. So, um, Looking forward to that. Um, also, fault injection and chaos testing. Um, things that, you know, you can essentially fake, you know, oh, what happens if all of a sudden my pod stops being able to talk to any other pods or things like that. Um, I have very little experience in that space, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to learning more about that. All right, I'm almost done, but I wanted to make sure um, before I, I wrap up, I wanted to introduce everyone to my colleague, Abraham Wodeji. Um, he was unable to make it to Valencia, um, but he's an awesome dude, and he did an incredible amount of work in our path to consuming and using Linkerd in, in a production. And I wanted to make sure that his work was not missed by me presenting, uh, because he's absolutely an integral and very important uh, part of the equation. Um, and thanks for joining. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and if you're interested in trying Xbox Cloud Gaming, um, you can go to xbox.com slash play. You can play Fortnite for free. Um, or you know, if you're an Xbox Game Pass Ultimate subscriber, you can play hundreds more. Thanks a lot. <laughs>